Okay. So more reds are being absorbed, um, which makes them more more green. Um, and you can adjust this as you wish. It, as in, you in my case, yes, because we're recording uh, in an almost a raw format, which gives me more latitude to change colors after the fact. But you do have to be really careful uh, with that. But the, if you imagine, right, the light's actually bouncing off of a yellow rock and it's coming back at the camera, but it's gone through blue light. So um, this is kind of the worst case scenario for doing white balance. Well, NASA does it all the time, my friend. I have no doubt she will do it and do it even better. Yeah, so we're getting that, that green hue on everything because it's the mixture of the yellow rock and the blue light kind of and yellow and blue mixed green. Yeah. At least that's my best guess. Like, again, that's... God, I cannot believe that fault line. Fault line? That's probably not the right word. Yeah, it's another nice, you know, it almost looks like the basalts. Yeah. Something similar is, you know, a crystallization. Look, look at those big yeah. logs that almost fell out of that one. Yeah. Yeah, as Larry explained it, this is, of course, as you know, the central peak of the, the, the whole caldera was lifted up when the magma inflated the chamber beneath it and then the bottom dropped out when the magma retreated and caused this collapse. Molten hot magma. And there's of course the difference between a crater and a caldera. A caldera is collapsed in on itself. Right. And I remember being astonished to learn that the coral uh, tolls in the Pacific were caused by, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the basalt at the center where the volcano was is much heavier than the uh, than the earth underneath it, and they ultimately gradually sink, and the coral that grew up around the cone is left. Is that fundamentally how they form? Because this rock is actually heavier than the rock beneath it. Was uh, my memory? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I think that's correct. I see some columns have fallen down there. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Can we? Uh Maybe just try to get close. Yeah. Ish. Oh, there's Shit. whole pieces broken off. Wow, yeah. So we we'll need to wrap this up in a minute or two. Yep. Roger that. I'll give you a nice fly out shot then of that. Roger. Selfie time. <laughs> For those folks just joining us too, Larry. Uh, oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that was really cool. And I right. like the smoke. We're just going to pretend that that is the smoke from ancient hydrothermal vents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll allow my inner discovery channel to come out a little bit. Aliens. <laughs> Jonathan, do you believe in aliens? Absolutely. I believe aliens are microbial life on planets billions of years away. Unless, of course, they're at Alien fi Area 51. Yeah, could they be more advanced than us? Who's to say that they're not already among us? And who's to say we're advanced? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that's, <true>. that's <laughs> super fair. <laughs> well, surprising, coming from the Canadian the group, huh? <laughs> Uh, no, I still retain my British. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, that's why he's flashing the marmite around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have to hunt high and low for that. But, <laughs> and they, they always seem to put it in the baking aisle for some reason, just because it says yeast product. I think you bake with it. <laughs> as much as I tell the store managers, they still don't move it. <laughs> it's a spread. <laughs> oh, man, we'd, on cheese on toast with a nice mature cheddar. <laughs> oh, now you're talking. That umami. Jonathan, do you believe in aliens? 
Yeah, yeah ghosts, is it Halloween? Do people believe in ghosts? I think so. I know so. Yeah. Oh, you know so. Do you yeah. have a ghost story for I mean, look at, us? Look at, look at I used to live in a haunted house. Oh, do yeah. you tell more? So a house we lived in in Scotland, um, just a, well, yeah, my wife and I, and then there was one area of the house that was always colder than anywhere else, and it didn't make any sense because it was right in the center of the house, and it wasn't near any outside walls or anything. And uh, when the, our son came along in 2008, we became even more present, and our two cats would sit at the top of the stairs, heads moving in unison at nothing moving, coming up the stairs. Uh, uh, Touch lamps like used to go on and off. And then one night I went down to the bathroom and actually walked through her. I did see an old woman at the bottom of the stairs and oh, walked you saw through an it. Old and woman. and uh, yeah, we subsequently found out we didn't know anything about the history of the house, but a, a previous occupant of the house had died at the bottom of the stairs, uh, and she was an elderly lady. So yeah. Where we, was the uh, house built? The house was built in uh, 1910, and I believe that woman died around. And 1940s, oh, she died. So once you found out that your house was haunted, what'd you do? Uh, nothing. She didn't. She wasn't threatening in any way. So she kind of hung around for a bit until, yeah, my wife got uh, a little annoyed with her and told her to leave. That we were all safe. That we were okay. That nothing was going to happen to us. She could go on her way. And the the oven door in the kitchen dropped down, smashed the glass, and we never saw her again. Or oh. felt. And the house, that part of the house, was never cold again either. So, Ooh. yeah. So we believe she uh, she vacated. Oh. Anyone else have any ghost stories? To that's share pretty on good Halloween? one. It'd be that hard is to a good one. That's a hard that's one to hard, top. I was gonna say. I don't know if you top that. So, all right. Should we get situated to go up? Yeah. Yeah. There's the vessels there. That's there. And then, okay, I'm going to come up this wall and see what, uh, start our ascent. Okay. Winch, winch, right above you. control, please come up 10 meters. Yeah. It might be easier to stretch out if we get a little altitude. Yeah, as soon as I get out of this uh, little area that I'm in, I'll, I'll start stretching out. All right. Well, I have a story to tell of a Hawaiian legend, but is operations okay if I tell a story? Or are you guys good up there? Yep. Okay. I think that's okay. We just might be a little non-responsive for a moment <laughs> while we get in position. Well, I can also wait too. Uh, it's just confirming coming off bottom, yeah, Simon, to uh, finish this. All right, as we start our ascent, Hercules' depth is 1,141 meters. Our water temperature is 3.79. Our oxygen saturation is 9.02%. And yeah, our we have. Uh, yes, you. Yeah. Get that tether up out. Yeah. That looks like that's going to be good for us.
the store zoomed in. <laughs> I am ready, auto heading is off. You let me know when uh, ready to go ahead and start ascending. Roger that. So Jonathan, now that we're heading on our ascent, I was wondering if you could just give us another t um, overview and tell us how is this what are the main objectives of this project? What are your goals out of here? And how does it work? Yeah, so um, we developed this camera system to do two things really well. Um, one of them is to uh, create uh, 3D models um, through a process called photogrammetry. Um, they, this system has three different cameras. Um, these cameras can be placed uh, apart from each other at different distances and um, using that distance and the distance of objects as they move through the frame, uh, you can calculate and, and do what's called structure from motion. Um, so essentially you're, you're creating how the, uh, how the image is changing across the three different cameras and you're calculating the 3D structure of that object. Um, the goal of that is to create uh, in near real time three-dimensional models that could be used in simulators in something like a potential video game. Um, all of which um, kind of helps to bring what I would describe as a, a very linear experience of watching a, a, a video, like a highlight clip, and um, making a non-linear experience. So a kid or a kid at heart could look at these models um, and uh, be able to explore an entire dive um, at their own pace because you can effectively compress several hours worth of video into one 3D model. Um, and you can tag it and and go um, and create just a, a truly data-rich uh, and immersive environment for something. You can, you can literally swim like the fish through the environment that we're doing. On the science angle, the fun part is going to be to actually take these data and um, uh, mesh them with other data such with uh, Uh, to take these data and actually mesh them with, with uh, other data sets like from uh, Norbit, um, which is creating its own little three-dimensional map of the world. Um, it can see much, much further out. Um, and then finally, uh, which is uh, going to be all through a process of processing data through reality capture, which actually Zach has been leading uh, on the back end. Zach, what are you doing um, with reality capture back in the data lab? Um, essentially what we're doing is we're taking all of these photos that we're taking, um, which can be thousands of photos per dive, um, and then we're kind of breaking them up into clips and scenes of different areas um, that we saw and turning it into a, a 3D model. So um, essentially what's happening is as we're going along taking all these photos, we are very intentional with it in terms of getting overlap between the photos um, and certain areas that have something of interest. And then from there, um, when we put them into a program like Reality Capture, it finds these similar points, um, known as tie points, between each photo, um, and then kind of interlaces them to, to make this 3D model. So, um, so far, um, it's been going pretty smooth in terms of data coming through, coming really quick, us grabbing the data in the lab and building that model um, within a very short time, especially, especially relative uh, to, to the time periods that Photogram Sheet typically works with. Um, so yeah, it's been interesting it, when you get the data so quick and can turn it into something else so quick, <laughs> which is the whole goal. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's been the main focus down in the data lab. Yeah, so one of the fun challenges of working with an ROV is that unlike a drone, um, the ROV doesn't have fantastic positional data. Like a drone with a modern GPS system, you'll get uh, precision down to the sub, you know, centimeter and even millimeter level of where the drone is, depending on the technology you're using. but. In this instance, since we don't really know where the, the ROV is, maybe plus or minus one meter, which is a lot 
for this style of work. It can be a little challenging. Zach, like, how has working with the models really been uh, like in terms of having reliable building across different uh, data sets? Um, it's been challenging across different ones. Um, certain ones come very quickly, and others it, it takes uh, quite a long time just to sort through the photos and figure out what even um, meshes in the first place. Um, and also, like you're talking about having locations set, um, we are lucky to have some type of um, GPS point that goes with each photo, because uh, once you're underwater, typically GPS is a, it can be a difficult thing to work with. So having that helps sometimes in terms of tying those figures together and getting those those photos to match. Um, but overall, like, it's really just a, a process of being patient um, and taking each step. And then eventually the goal is to get it to a point where, where it's going much quicker. Um, but we're really kind of in that stage of figuring out what the perfect setup is for all with this new camera setup to make sure later it can kind of just be augmented and just kind of um, producing these models as we put them in. Yeah, and that, that for myself, um I've been, it's been fantastic watching that team learn a new program and especially just to share the experience of developing a, uh, the path for how to, t how to create these models in a time efficient and a reliable fashion. Because it, yeah. it goes from the start to finish to, to do this right. You, it starts with the right camera in many ways, but then it really starts with the right way to fly the ROV. How do you position those cameras to get reliably good data with how the ROV must fly just by the nature of what it's doing? Yeah. How do we get images up here? We struggled on the first couple of days just because of the volume of images that were coming up and making yeah. all those adjustments. Yeah, and I think that's where like all the hands on deck really made a difference because um, none of us knew exactly how it was going to come through that first day. And we were all trying different little um, tricks within the program and then we all kind of came together. Uh, came with a pretty solid SOP such that we can all follow now. Um, but yeah, those first couple days, it, it was definitely everybody work it out, figure it out, see see what we get. And um, yeah, we ended up coming with a pretty pretty good processing at this point. But yeah, all of us down in the data lab and, and all the ROV drivers, everybody um, coming together to make this work is, is really the only way to do it. Um, and it's yeah pretty special to be in an environment where you have all those people so close and working together the way we are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm actually just looking at reality capture right now. I just threw 10,000 images from the start of this dive. I know it's going to be remarkable to see what happens out of these. Oh wow, that's going to be a good one. So Jonathan, um, comments in the chat are, they're saying thank you for making the 3D models downloadable on Sketchfab. And then also they want to know, is the position of the data really off? They thought that maybe you could get a better location data on the ROV with the INS on the vehicle, since the USBL can come in and out of accuracy. We got a fantastic ROV savvy person. <laughs> is that is that Trevor or something like that out there? Um, no. the. Or actually, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say no. It's a fantastic observation. Could, could and you please explain what INS and USBL for our not ROV savvy listeners mean? Um, what does INS actually stand for, Dan? Inertial Navigation System. So how does that work? So it depends, but normally you have something that's spinning um, or ring laser, you know, gyroscope. So some type of gyroscope, right? And that essentially keeps spinning, and that keeps your heading. So you will now know your pitch, which is your up and down, your roll, and your angle. Um, so that, that, that essentially on the craft. And then USBL is ultra short baseline. Um, and that's essentially acoustic sort of telemetry where it pings, and it responds back, and it listens to the time and direction, and says, here's where you know, and the triangulates essentially where you're at. So what you try to do is combine the two and say, here's what the USBL has, here's what the INS unit says was my was my pitch and roll, and this thing called a Kalman filter is usually what you use to stitch those together to give you the highest navigational accuracy of both of them together. And what and how does that differ from the type of data that would come out of a USBL? So USBLs, uh, you know, it just gives you positional things. But as you move through the water, if the, you know, 
it has one an angular mm -hmm. error and it has a time error, right? So each ping comes back and it's sort of like, you, you know, it, it, it's not one place for a ping to ping, right? So it's sort of like a shot, you know, yeah. it's, you, you take the average of a round of a couple of samples to give you a better position location. Well, I think that the, the answer to the question is that um, I am working and relying on the work of um, Chris, Chris Krasnovsky, who developed uh, the software package that is actually allowing us and allowed us to visualize um, the data coming out of the Norbit sensor. So a great thing about a ship like this is that there are other people that have solved problems like this before. And in his instance, um, he's dedicated an incredible amount of his considerable intellect towards thinking about those exact problems. Because especially with something like sonar data, the positional accuracy of, of, of what ping and what returns and how they're coming back and the accuracy and the precision of those is really, really matters. If I'm just using photogrammetry for you know basic modeling and for creating fun video games and even simulators, um, I like that my models are very precise and, and they're around the right spot on planet Earth, but it's not mission critical that they are, right? For using uh, data out of Norbit, it could be mission critical because they're planning dives. And so it's a long-winded way of saying I'm using filtered data um, to achieve the most accurate uh, positional data off the ROV as possible, but I definitely did not uh, develop the algorithms that we're using to know exactly where ROV is, uh, ROV Hercules is. Um, Dave, is it possible to get the Triclops PC on SAT-3? It is. Um, so I just took a peek at our, our processing computer um, uh, that we use this and it uh, looks like it's uh, been chewing in the background in an automated fashion on a bunch of the models as we were going through this dive. Um, and it created one model. It looks like this was taken at about 10 o'clock UTC, so, or I'm sorry, at midnight, uh, which is so about five hours ago. Um, and it's probably about a kilometer and a half long. Um, but it goes from that um, kind of wavy um, lava flow down towards the bottom of the stream. And... Oh. I don't back. think they have it quite up yet. Oh, whoops. I'm trying to find it. Where is it these days? Mm, we've try. Moved, we've moved things around. Oh, it's on ROV wide, the original. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, I don't. So I've messed up one of the uh, monitors here, so I have to do I this. Very cool. I mean, this is really cool. Yes. This it is, is what's been processing. Oh, yeah, there's those pumpkins back. That's satellite feed one. They're pretty tough pumpkins, I have yeah. to say, to deal with that pressure. Doesn't seem like much change. I think we should have the Okay, ROV someone's static. hypothesis was they were gonna, ex you know, right. explode on the way up. So I, let's see I if that's we, true. I think we, yeah. Simon's <laughs> up to the challenge to give a little pumpkin squeeze or something <laughs> there. So up on satellite feed um, three now is the result of a bunch of hard work from um, the entire team here. From again, I mentioned from ROV all the way up to Data Lab. Um, so this is, we throughout this whole dive, we've been running um, these data in a semi-automated fashion um, in the background and processing these 3D photogrammetry models that I've been referring to. And in this case, um, it looks like it's constructed maybe about a half a kilometer's worth of data, if I'm guessing, based off of the timestamps. And um, this shows kind of what I mean when I say we're going to be creating virtual worlds that you can fly through. So the little rectangles that you see are the images that were used to construct the majority of the scene that you're currently flying over. Uh, that's the actual ROV view that was taken to construct that moment. Um, and you can see kind of in this pre-rendered form what this is going to look like. So this is really what we saw throughout maybe an hour or so of footage of slowly going through the sea floor. Looks like we stopped and we looked at whatever object this was for some time. There's some sort of rock, so you can see it's 
kind of rendered in further three dimensions. It's currently rendered as a point cloud because we haven't actually gone through and done all the texture work, but you can see it's still quite an effective way of viewing this. And then it looks like we started to go up a slope. This must have been towards the base of the caldera, right, while we were still there. We went up the slope and we started looking and ascending the side of the cliff. And so you could see again, all of those white spots represent where the ROV was actually going and its relation and how it ascended and um, kind of the path that we took to go to those spots. So it looks like we got up here. Really cool, look at this. We went kind of in this little Star Wars slot canyon and this is this is ultimately the power of what this of this tool is is while we were looking at um, this we we undoubtedly situationally we were situationally aware enough to know that we were inside of a canyon right um, but this view this ability to view in 3D post uh, dive or even during the dive if we can get this whole process running smoothly enough um, really offers this unique and different experience perspective of what we did situational awareness that can aid in planning of future dives or um, as I mentioned the the um, the outreach uh, potential you, you can also see we had a lot of questions early on about um, oh man how steep is the terrain that we're going off of it can be difficult when you're in the moment to see what how steep it is right but once you render through the structure and motion analysis uh, the entire 3D scene, suddenly you can see some of these vertical walls that the ROV came up on as it was ascending the, the, from the caldera um, on the inside. And then it looks like we kind of crested to the top, and then we started to meander our way on down following the secondary ridge line, continuing on our exploration. So that's, that's kind of the background and a great example. Again, this is five hours ago that we were doing this, uh, that we did this track line. Very unique view. Um, and and all the ultimate goal of this whole project is to, um, of course, dial in the cameras, prove the cameras, but the cameras are like, the cameras are only tools. They, they're not the important thing, although I, I really like cameras. The, the important thing is actually the process for the whole team to come down to make that possible right there. I mean, that that's awesome. Just looking at it more and more and realizing, I mean, that that's, that's a great distance and several hours worth of video data that was compressed down to a single unified 3D model that's geo-referenced and on the right, right spot on planet Earth. Well, I just think it gives you a whole other tool because before we're just looking at image after image or video feed and trying to do it. But now you're actually able to put this all together and say, how does one image relate to the other? And how does this image relate to things that we've taken two hours into the dive? And you can quickly look at that. And then, like you said, is if we need to, we can click on any one of those white boxes and see the actual picture yeah. uh, right next to it. And then you can go say, oh, OK, is this, is this equal to this? So it's a, it just changes the way we do research by having this visualization. And this is how our minds kind of think. They make these connections. Um, without this, you know, we're not able to see the patterns that we would be able to see without it. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. I think a couple of years ago, we were flying with stills cameras doing photo mosaics. And now we're doing it with video in this short yeah. space of time to, to do it. It's incredible. And, it, you know, none of this is new. Um, uh, at all in terms of photogrammetry or even doing it underwater and even doing it in the deep sea. But, but for myself, the, the goal of trying to do this and applying these production ready tools um, and just how efficient it's become to be able to honestly, I'd love to tell everyone that I'm an absolute expert at photogrammetry um, and that I'm really going deep in with all of this programming to make it all work. But the reality is that the reason we're using this program and the entire point of this project is to test whether we can train up um, and use a tool that was designed to be relatively user-friendly and designed to work. Um, and, and that's been a case, you know, Zach, Zach, how much experience did you have with photogrammetry coming in with this and reality capture? Uh, not in reality capture. I've done other photogrammetry, but never yeah. working with this program. Maybe yeah. uh, what what other programs did you use? Oh, gotta have to look. Microsoft? I, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Use that one, and then 
like I've done like the diving for it before and been like the person out there capturing the image and that side of it. Um, yeah. And I'd say the biggest difference there is you can just redo it if you need to as a diver. <laughs> um, here, we who knows when we'll come back to these spots or if we'll come back to these spots. And so I think this method takes a lot, a lot of preparation, a lot of planning and coordinating everybody because yeah, we don't know when we're going to get back. And while we're here, it's this is a big reason. So we got to make sure we execute. And again, yeah, I think like you were saying before, everybody getting together on that same page to get, to get make it possible. Um, we kind of joked down, you know, down the lab. It's like our part is is really the least stressful because that means everybody else was accomplished their job, and now it's ours to finish uh, to finish yeah. the job, right? Yeah. Like yeah. if we're getting data, that's that's the best case scenario. And so. Um, yeah, we've all had fun down there figuring this out and working together and, and um, yeah, just just doing it as a team down there. But a lot of technologies had to mature to come to this point. So you need the camera, the low light cameras to get yep. to a point. You need the JPEG compression so that you can set it up, you know, the fiber. You need the fiber technology and the compression through that. Then you need this reality capture software. So, I mean, you kind of had to wait till they all matured to this point to be able to take advantage of it. Yeah. Because we've had each one of these kind of separately for a long period of time, but until they all got to a point where we could merge them together, one of those was the holdup. Yep. No, it's totally, it's totally true. It's all, it's all, and I'm excited to see where, where it's going to end up going. If, they, if the technology has matured this much in just, you know, five, 10 years, uh, where is it going to be? And I, you see hints at this now for, for, how they're developing for reality capture and other ways to get things in. Right now, uh, the easiest way to create a 3D model is with uh, an application on your phone, right? There's built-in LiDAR on phones, yep. um, uh, which which enables an insane amount of accuracy, considering that you're just waving your phone around a, a kitchen mug, and then you can put that mug inside your video game with about three or four clicks, literally three or four clicks, and you can have it inside of a, a, a full simulation uh, physics-based uh, computer graphics uh, world. I mean, Google Street View is almost going to that, where yeah. it's three-dimensional. Yeah. And that's with LiDARs. You know, they use both LiDARs and stereo cameras because they have the big pod that goes on the top of their <laughs> top of the cars <laughs> they drive around. I'm sure you've all seen them. But that just collects all that data at once and geolocates it. Absolutely awesome. So Jonathan, someone in the um, chat is asking if this is from the main Hercules camera or the Tricops camera view. They really wanted to take one of these dives and run it through a video through something like that. But getting it all pulled apart and into a program off of YouTube videos is not the easiest. Oh, yeah. No, it's not the easiest. Um, you can totally do this through Zeus data. Like, um, uh if you pulled off an hour of footage um, where we were doing great exploration and ideally it was one where we were kind of low and we were we were soaring over a bunch of very detailed objects like corals if you ran that through a program like reality capture or agrisoft or pix 4 day um, and there's just a ton of different applications out there that all do fantastic jobs uh, you would probably come up with with some pretty awesome models um, so the only challenge as you said as you mentioned over YouTube is is just how compressed it is and that's really going to put a damper um in in too much detail uh, to be able to make this work. And and at the end of the day, although Zeus creates an incredible image for that that remains uh totally rock solid after 15 years, uh the resolution really isn't enough to do um to do photogrammetry at this scale. Um you can do it, but it's 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 just not ideal. There's there's just not enough pixels um, to to do it really well. But if you are interested, the coolest thing to do is take a uh, you take your camera around maybe while your cat is sleeping. I highly recommend that because it's hilarious. We actually got a fantastic 3D model of a goosefish that refused to move, and so. As the ROV flew over, we have an insanely detailed, probably the only, dare we say the only, 3D model of a goosefish at depth, which we were, we have already published on our Sketchfab account. You can print him. It was the pout-pout fish from one of the first dives. Um,
But anyway, if you uh, want to get into photogrammetry and see how cool it is, I uh, get download one of these photogrammetry apps, wait for your cat to uh, sleep, and then try to do a 3D scan of them. It's magic when it appears. Um, it truly is. And someone is volunteering as tribute, as someone to train up and make that program run for the ROV dives, and they think it'll be the coolest thing to ever do. <laughs> yes. One of us. <laughs> Nice. Well, the goal, the goal that I'd love to do, uh, Rachel, Rachel Simon is 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 our close partner with this pro, uh, um, this entire uh, project, and she's the brains behind all of the automation, all of the programming, troubleshooting some of the the, the gremlins of working with this brand of camera. Um, and so the the, the long term conniving um, is now that we've kind of nailed down a good approach to how to collect the data is to automate the back end um, of it. So reality capture, another reason we chose that is it has a good command line interface to control it. So um, we can basically just say reality capture, take a look at this folder, and every time this folder has 400 images, process a model off of it and shove it, uh, shove it up into the cloud. Um, and that, that ultimately is how we will get to that vision of we can have a video game instance next year Video game instance where as you are in it uh, and a model is generated on the ship, I want that model to appear in the video game so you can explore it. And our, our, our goal our goal is going to be for that model to appear within two hours of us seeing it. That's pretty impressive. Just two hours for next year. We can get faster and faster. But that would be, that would be really cool. It's the, it's, imagine, it's the DLC of... Um, of deep water exploration to be able to make that happen. And you could just think just how incredible that would be if then you, we can tag up the objects with the video that we saw of that actual moment, all the SPL. We can go full minority report with all of this fantastic data. Um, we got lat long, we got salinity, temperature, all of these cool depth um, ways to visualize that, go full HUDs. Could be, it could be a really immersive way to, to explore what we're doing. And Jonathan, can you tell our viewers how they can find us on Sketchfab? Sketchfab.com slash EV Nautilus. Um, we also have a number of great educational resources. If you're looking, if you're a teacher out there, we created a couple of 3D printed Nautilus um, uh, and other lessons involving some of the uh, some of the samples that we've also 3D scanned on the ship. Um, those are all available at nautiluslive.org/education. I highly recommend you look at those if you're interested in knowing how to apply some of these 3D models into uh, lesson plans or to print them yourself at home. Yes, there's lots of educational tools. You can also sign up for our ship to shore interactions um, and you can learn on the technology side of it, 3D printing, You can. Uh, they also have STEM resources, look into the biology ecosystem of animals. Uh, so if you're a teacher or if you are a stay at home mom and trying to entertain your kids for the weekend, definitely has some fun activities in there for you to check on out. I feel that one. Say at home mom or dad. Yep. Sometimes when it's raining outside, I'll do anything. All right, so Chad, if you have any questions, please type them in. If you have, Jonathan is at your mercy. Bring it. <laughs> um, as we head on up, we're gonna stop once we get to, 50 meters, and we are currently at 489 meters, and our water depth is 6.77 degrees Celsius, and we're increasing in our oxygen as we continue up to the surface, and we are now at 9.07%, and our salinity is 34.2 PSU. Huh. So Jonathan, they would like to know how beefy is the computer 
running reality capture and multiple GPUs? Uh, I love that question and thank you. Uh, we do have a fully fledged 100% top of the line gaming computer currently on Nautilus. Uh, it has an <laughs> it doesn't have multiple GPUs, but it has an RTX 4090 on it, one of the top tier cards, and it uses every available inch of that horsepower um, to to be able to do that. Um, yeah, it is it is computationally expensive to do this, and and mostly it's only expensive because we want to do it really quickly. You know, we can we can do this all relatively slowly, and it'll work just fine. Um, but but we're trying to do things pretty rapidly so that we're not up until three o'clock in the morning every single night. Um, it also creates a lot of heat, so a great want, deal of heat. If you want a heater for the week, you know, yep. winter, that's what you get. Yeah, You do absolutely. your models and heat your house at the same time. Yep, yep, it's a hundred percent. How late have you guys been staying up, Zach, running these models? Uh. Midnight-ish, 11-ish sometimes. Depends. We usually try to get started early in the day and take a midday nap because your, yeah, midday your brain gets solid. fried looking at points and photos all day. It is, um, it's really tough because we're all, we're all also on watches. So yeah. there's only so much you really can do. We weren't staffed to really do this, you know, super intensive 24-7 kind of yeah. operations. But you started, you started at like midnight, and it comes out in the morning. It's waiting yeah. for you. Yeah, Hopefully. yeah there's a lot of... There's yeah. a lot of waiting with these bigger models, yes. and we're throwing thousands of photos at it. Just the aligning process is more than a, a you know a 10-minute period. Sometimes we we can leave, go eat a meal, come back, and it's still aligning. So um, it's yeah. great though when you can throw all those photos at it. it saves you a lot of time, and you know it kind of sorts the mess out itself too. And um, yeah, reality capture has been really, really helpful for it feels um, really good moving things along. So Zach, I have a student who's asking a question. One of my students. Um, he wants to know what is the most common that we saw on this dive. I would say the eel. What do you think? Fish-wise? Yeah, definitely. Well, the... not just fish-wise, just any of the animals. We did see oh, shrimp, yeah. but I felt like we had more eels yeah, than shrimp. Yeah, especially there. What was our the final end? shrimp count? What's he got? Looks like he's got 13 or 14. And then oh. um, he's also asking if we keep a tally or list of animals for further research. Um, we record. Um, at least the one of it. Like I don't record every single time we see a single fish. Um, if we see a large group of them, we'll note that. If it's a new one we hadn't seen yet on the dive, we will note that. Um, but also, again, when we're doing things like photogrammetry, and that's the goal, we don't necessarily take the time to zoom in on each individual animal we see. Um, if we do, that really throws off the photogrammetry. Um, it makes that much more difficult. So um, like today, we didn't necessarily zoom in on those. We can get a good idea of what species that fish was, um, just because we've also seen them before. So it, it just depends, really. Um, but yeah, on these dives this week, because photogrammetry has been kind of the main goal we're trying to work for, um, we haven't taken the time to zoom, zoom in, especially on you know every individual thing we see. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we've missed a handful of organisms this trip, but um, I don't think there's anything that nobody here has ever seen. Um, we've got people who have been here a long time, and if it was something they've never seen before, they definitely would have you know, let us all know, so. Yeah, and I think um, it also, the amount of data we collect is also different depending on the expedition and what the goals of that expedition yeah, are. Definitely. So if we're doing one where we're measuring a biodiversity, then we'd keep a much more, um, not conclusive, I guess a conclusive, just, just like a more, more, depth one, yeah. more in depth, detailed, yeah. um, list and tally of different species we see yeah. but here because we're doing the photogametry we are still collecting that data but maybe not quite to the same level of depth yeah and detail well and it's like you know, when we saw that big school of the fish we definitely took time to you know yeah. look at that and explore it because nobody had seen that before right yeah. but um, those were the same fish also that we'd been seeing just individually kind of sparse. Yeah, yeah it was just the first time we've seen like a big school yeah. of it yeah so we do make exceptions sometimes <laughs> for the photogrammetry but yeah, and that note, that, but that's that's why we're concentrating. That's why it's actually so awesome to be able to have this entire expedition where we're we're focused in on process. It's because it is the goal that we can have this style of um, data capture happening in the background without user input. Yeah, because we shouldn't be um, pausing to do photogrammetry perfectly. That you know, we we should be using zoos. We should have. We should allow the uh, this system should work despite and complement what we're already doing rather than getting in the way of science. Right, um, right. So, 
it's a long-winded way of saying like it's got to work and it's got to work in the background and the camera has to work at the right spot without being right in front of Zeus like it currently is right there it has to be protected etc 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 we have to figure out how to deal with the data yeah I think it's fair to say there's a lot of firsts this week like with the whole camera setup and everything right yeah, that absolutely getting yeah. that figured out it was the most important part going yeah. forward um, yeah but every single technology starts out here you gotta have your you gotta have the trial run, right? Yeah. You gotta go back and you gotta figure out, okay, now how do we really make this solid? Yeah. So and then this is not the first time. You're put this on again and it'll be better. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Steep learning curve. So the chat is also asking if the hurt cam footage gets sent to a data lab for review and gets archived. Definitely sent to the data lab and archived, yes. Um, on both of them. Currently, well, sorry, so first of all, our Zeus data on a normal ROV operation, we have staffed um, both inside the control room and on our scientists ashore, as we had mentioned a little bit earlier, the capacity and kind of the, the know-how to do better annotations during the dive. I think that's very important. We have a chief scientist if we know that we're out there for biology that has drawn together the team of scientists ashore that can make those annotations work in the field because most of the data, unless a scientist has a specific question, it's not like we're going back through the data. Um, but the funding for that level of post-cruise analysis and annotation yeah. is generally not there. Although, Zach, actually, that's that's kind of your, the world you're living in right now, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're using a, a camera just on the reef, and there's a lot of footage to go back through. Um, but we... We are lucky to have a lot of, similar to this, a lot of viewers who watch, and they're giving us time stamps constantly, and so we can use that as well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just building the archive to train it and get it to the point where where it is, you know, doing that work for us, and we're not sitting there for hours yeah. looking through and doing every single thing. But, yeah, you got to start somewhere. Got to archive that footage and get it, get that database built up. Yeah, and so for, for, for OET, you know, we go out there, we support the expedition for um, the different sponsors that might be sponsoring that expedition and the different scientists that are leading that expedition. So that will impact kind of the, the direction of, of, um, of the data logs themselves and that annotation and whether or not the annotation needs to be kind of appended in post but generally we're not the ones that would end up doing that after we end an expedition. Mm -hmm. However, we do archive all of our footage um, after a dive. There's the rolling deck repository for all of the uh, uh, sensor data and uh, the video as well as distributed to our scientists at the end of a cruise. as they went down by the looks of it. They may be a little saltier. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, salted pumpkin. Yeah, Have some I more wonder. iron Just and some hydrogen thin, sulfate. Put it on the sun. Dehydrate. I wonder if they'll be squishy. That's what I think. Like, do you think they've sliced all the cells and squished them? I would assume so, but I don't know. It is pretty hard pressure. I wonder if they float. <laughs> they don't like to be floating. No. Uh, kind of sad pumpkins. They're neo pumpkins, like hey. small, <laughs> like the baby pumpkins. They're the first pumpkins yes. to go where no other pumpkins have gone before. The yeah. first pumpkins, pumpkins as he's never seen them before at three thousand meters. The world. So one of the commenters says that they are someone who watches the dives nearly religiously and is not too bad with IDs if anyone needs annotation for footage. Checking in with um, 
OET groups of dive watchers online wouldn't be a bad idea. They know they wouldn't mind getting paid to annotate and watch <laughs> some dives. That would be awesome. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. We'll have to find the Discord group that was mentioned a couple days ago. I'll drop some hot links about what we're doing out here and some of the uh, most notable dives. So one viewer says that, uh, like they said before, that they think the pumpkins are going to have cracks on the bottom of them and be filled with water for sure. Oh, we'll have to take a... Yeah, uh, once... Uh, uh, once it gets back on deck, we can take a hard look at it to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And film a video, so keep an eye on our social Did media. Did we weigh them before they went down? See how much water we intrusion we had? I mean, we're a boat full of scientists, so I'm pretty sure no one thought of that. No, no one thought of that. <laughs> yeah, no. So we were discussing that right after. <laughs> Devin and I of, were like, wow, I wonder what the weight we difference will be. better with this uh, pumpkin <laughs> experiment of ours. I mean, I'm just happy really that we had pumpkins. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it was an adventure even to get those Thank pumpkins. Thank you to everyone who went to get pumpkins. Yes. Even though apparently we had one on board. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> those are the largest pumpkins crew. available currently on the Big Island right there. Yes, I was wondering the same thing. So, the, Zach, especially with you and your um, reef cameras, do you participate in Zooniverse? So I actually have my students participate in Zooniverse. Have you heard of Zooniverse before? Never heard of it. Okay, so Zooniverse is a citizen science project. So you can upload videos, photos, and you can have citizens go through and annotate your video and footage for you. So I actually have my students do this as a project where they get a pick and there's ones called Eyes on the Reef and there's other some deep sea ones and they have space ones. There's all sorts of projects. They even have ones yeah. where you go through history and you help transcribe old documents. Yeah. So it's a wide range. It's a really cool website that um, you could actually upload your photos or videos and then you have people do yeah. the work for you and then you have it so many people and so many eyes that it kind of gets through errors right because it's your average yeah, of how yeah, many yeah. identifications and things like that it usually has like a little tutorial on it mm. um it's a really cool website you should check it out yeah yeah i've never used that before and then that way it also you know saves your valuable time of yeah. having other people kind totally. of go through and collect right. your data for you yeah, I'll have to look into that because, yeah, sharing videos is often difficult to people where you don't know where they are or who they are and, yeah. you know, just want to send them some data. But I'm sure this website has a whole thing for it because they definitely, there's yeah. sometimes footage or photos, some of it's videos. Hmm. Um, but, yeah. Would you like the counts? Yes, let's get the official count. So for this dive, I counted 13 shrimp, two sea cucumbers, and one goosefish. <laughs> We're that was a one-eyed one. Yeah, one-eyed one goosefish. One-eyed goosefish, or pirate goosefish. What's a pirate's favorite letter? R. Oh, you think it'd be R, but it's actually the C. Oh. <laughs> nice. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right, our depth is 108 meters. We're at water temperature 23.7 degrees Celsius. Our oxygen has gone up tremendously. We're at 83.8% .8 oxygen. And our salinity is 35 PSUs. So you only have about 50 meters left to get any of those questions or last comments in. Does anyone know about the EV Nautilus Discord group and can share about it? I'm not on Discord, so I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I don't know about it. So in comments, if you're in an EV, if you're in the EV Nautilus Discord group, please share. Apparently another viewer wants in. 
So Mike, the viewers are saying, can you do the whole pirate alphabet? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. It's pretty easy. Oh, what is it? A I R. <laughs> oh. And then apparently um, a lot of live stream oceanographic discords were involved in the Fathmanet from Mbare and some of the model training for AI they are working on. And why didn't the so skeleton go to the dance? Because <laughs> he had no body to go with. <laughs> 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 So I saw a squid. Oh, are we going to get inked again? No, nah, I'm just saying, we're coming to that point. Yeah, we are, once we hit that 50 meters. So I think our squids have kind of become our time to notify the viewers that we are now at 50 meters. So that is going to be all from us today. We're going to start retrieval. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. Bye. Good night. Yep. Yep. You hear me now?
control, uh, deck. Yeah, can her give a kick ahead there, please? Uh, control, uh, stand by one, we have a, a turn in the, in the, what do you call it, recovery line.
Uh, control, can Herc uh, drive ahead a small bit? Can Herc drive ahead, please? station. I'll stop. Control, this is back deck, uh, that's what's starting to heave in on Herc. Yeah. Pop up the surface there again.
Uh, control deck. We had uh, two wraps uh, initially in it, and uh, uh, we have one more now to take out. Oh, sorry, say again. I no worries. No, it just could have been put in when we threw it on. Can you give a kick ahead? Okay, that's the line connected to her starting to recover.
That's her passing the transom. Power secured.